I, I do apologize for filling your brain. Uh, <laughs> part of that uh, is um, part of that is because okay. I'm passionate about content. Uh, and, but this is the downside of getting someone to come in as a speaker when they're working at the leading edge of research. <laughs> where, where we were talking so about sorry. stuff that was presented that's pretty revolutionary at an architecture conference in October. Uh, so after that, um, I had the opportunity to do this class in Finland, and those slides are on my website. I had three hours, and in those three hours, I actually spent 55 minutes actually working on the pattern language. We wrote two patterns in the class. So given that I like, given 90 minutes today, um, I couldn't cover 55 minutes to actually run this an exercise. So, I that way I was talking to Jeremy and said that I'd actually be happy to take this offline and um, have a workshop with people that are just doing pattern language, except I'm leaving um, Friday night to go to California, and then after that I'm going directly to Tokyo, and then I'm going to Shanghai, so I'm back on April 8th. Can you inform us what might happen, or if there's some other opportunity to catch more? I, I, I live in Toronto, I'm here, so it's like, we can always do stuff. Just do you have some kind of representation of like an end product pattern language, like to actually The research paper that I presented, there was a paper. Okay. And so the paper, what the paper does is it actually goes through Christopher Alexander's multi-service center, right from his book, and then says, this is what like look at a doorknob, and let's look at it instead. So winding children was actually a pattern that he wrote in a different way. So I can get that and I can load it up under the module for today so you guys can access it. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, although it's really with a grain of salt you have to do this because, again, I don't teach at universities. I don't have the deadlines you guys have. So my role in educating you on system thinking is to open your head up. Right? <laughs> now, <laughs> now, as a PhD student, so, I, so remember, I started writing this dissertation in 2006. A normal dissertation, which has nothing to do with the pattern language, incidentally. This is stuff that I'm doing incidentally. A normal dissertation is between 100 and 150 pages. My dissertation is um, about 200 pages, but I rewrite chapter 9, it's probably getting like 240 pages plus 300 pages of appendices. And the dissertation itself is half footnotes. <laughs> because I'm going over all these different fields, right? So um, the, when people, normally when you advise people to work on a thesis, they say, don't make it your life's work. Um, wow. Don't make it, and it's because people are at the beginning of their career, and then you have time to work stuff out. But I'm retired. And so when, when this thing gets published, like my, 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 my friend, my reviewer, uh, Dana Fox, looked at it and said, there's nothing left on the table. Like, when I've done this dissertation, there's nothing left. And I'm going to do a week of finishing it, right? So, so the stuff you're seeing, and the reason that I feel like a slide inserted into the one that was given, as I said a day previously, is because it's like, oh my god, I don't be able to understand this unless I explain this first. So when you see the dog, you'll see the slide that explains it. So, so now I'm going to go like deep into theory. So this is actually the stuff that uh, <laughs> I've actually not been giving you theory. This is not theory. This is not PhD level stuff. This is master's level content. Okay? <laughs> because now I'm going to go to the next level because um, because there's some background behind system thinking. And this is some of the content. But it's also the stuff that's changed recently. So um, we talked about system thing, we're talking where you're coming from. And uh, Russ Acoff's stuff is fundamentally based in teleology, with teleology is the study of ends, those so goals, objectives, those sorts of things. And I'm going to move you over, um, and again, this is how current the stuff is, uh, into ecological anthropology, which is like, wow, this is really obscure. This is so obscure. <laughs> Uh, I discovered this guy named Tim Ingold, um, and uh, I fell into his work, and actually my whole chapter nine in my dissertation is based, I, I changed my philosophy of science because of this guy's work. Um, and he is an ecological anthropologist, he just retired. Uh, there was an opportunity to see him in Dublin at a conference presenting at IFIC Working Group 8.2. Well, I think working group 8.2 <coughs> is a social theory group that works in computer science. So 
So, you know, for these people, like, communities of practice is like, oh yeah, it does like ancient history, right? And they had this guy, the speaker, so I went to see him. Now, the history of science is that, um, and this is where I had to bring you up, is that there's this different philosophy, because when we start talking about affordances, affordances, like I gave you this idea, it was based off the, off the work of J.J. Gibson, and that's in ecological psychology. So I have to explain a little bit of that. So I said before that I was going to start off a little bit with Russ Acoff. Um, and so this is the definition um, in a paper, the one, the, the single definition. You actually have not been getting definitions from me. You get definitions from other people's work that's integrated. The one definition you get from me, what is system thinking? System thinking is a perspective on wholes, parts, and their relations. It's a perspective because there are other perspectives that exist. But it does have to do with wholes and parts and their relations. Now, there's actually a branch of philosophy called Mariology, which is a whole part, which is not completely what I'm just thinking about. Um, but this goes back to Aristotle. Now, let's, let's take it the way that Russ Acoff normally describes this. And, you, and you'll get this in, um, gar, jar, in uh, Job Sheet Garbage Doggy's book. And actually, you got him to explain this to me. So there's three ideas essential in this frame. Function, structure, and process. So what is function? Function is contribution of the part to the whole. Okay, so let's get an example. The example is the TTC. So what, what the, the, the net of this is, I say, when, when the streetcar is late and you get on the streetcar, do not yell at the driver. The driver is just doing his job. The problem with transportation in Toronto is not in Toronto. The problem is the containing hole. The containing hole is the profits. If you are going to worry about transportation in Toronto, Toronto can only do so much. The province said we couldn't put tolls on the roads. So it's a containing hole, the problem is. So can you explain what's going on? And Russ Acom always starts off with function. Okay, so on top of function, you have structure, which is arrangement in space, and you have process, which is arrangement in time. Okay, so I have this structure. You have parts, and you have interactions between the parts. And in the structure, they're at the same time. In process, they are over time. So the skill testing question, which comes first, structure or process? We're running over time, Peter. We took a break in the so uh, I can hurry this up. I know the answer. <laughs> This is a good one. <laughs> okay. Process? Why? Because the pro <laughs> because I guess the process is about the choices that are made about how transportation is planned and whatever. No? <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> no. So like wouldn't it depend on the end of, like individual system or like how like like it doesn't seem like it's the kind of thing that there would be one prescribed answer for every single system that exists. Okay, so this is a little bit of a trick question. There is an answer, but I'll tell you that I went to system conferences for eight years, and then I was walking along with Jay Swanson, and I, I kind of had this question. He said, "Oh, it's obvious, isn't it?" And I go, "No, it's not <laughs> it's obvious. Process comes before structure." And the reason process comes before structure is because it's about perspective. When you look at a mountain, a mountain you perceive as structure, but the mountain changes. So a mountain is the slowest changing process ever. Yes? Okay. Um, I, I could understand that process would come before structure, but because the process is achieving an objective, and then the structure supports it, but that's not. No, no, there's not, that's not even the objective, it's the systems. So we can talk about now, we can talk about uh, human cells. We can talk about function, structure, and process of human cells. And, and there's no goal associated with that. Yes? You can talk about anything, like maybe we can, like would you, my understanding of what you're saying is that 
like an event, you wouldn't host an event without planning the sort of process of organizing things before, right? Like I'm, I'm talking about, I'm trying to define what is a system, which is a really dangerous thing, like dancing around it. <laughs> Be, because I tell so, so I never fall, I try to not fall into the question when people ask, what is a system? Because as, as I, I do try to answer the question, what is system thinking? So system thinking in the ACOF sense involves process, structure, and function. And you end up with these three concepts, and they are universal concepts in like human knowledge. So when I do business strategy workshops in China, that work through a translation, they understand function, they understand structure, they understand process. This is really like ancient Greek stuff, right? So how do you describe the world? You can describe the world in terms of function, structure, and process. Now the order in which you do that makes a difference. Now we get the representation. So if you take a functional view, like organization design, right? There's the functional view of the organization. There's a structural view of the organization. There's a process view of the organization. When you're designing computer systems, there's a functional, there's a structural, <coughs> and a process oriented. So this brings us to the next slide. But Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But then why are you seeing process before structure? Like just going back to what you're saying about like at the cellular level, humans, like you would want to understand the function of the cell. No, you might not want to understand the process. You, uh, you, if you have a cell, um, so not all systems have holes. So if you have a child who's born to you. Does that child have a goal? To continue existing care. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It kind of drives you. Know, like, yeah. so, yeah. so, so this is why we get into philosophy. Because, because when you talk systems, systems is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. And so the reason that we discuss systems in this way, and the reason I got into systems, so let's go back to my background. I got into IBM. And what I'm trying to do is organization design and computer design. What do they have in common? They have systems. And if you define and look at the world in terms of systems, organizations have function structure process, computers have function structure process. Okay, now I can discuss them. Ecology, I can discuss function structure process. It's a universal sort of way. But then it's like, what do you mean by function structure process? So, just trying to get clear here. Function is contribution of a part to the whole. Structure is arrangement of the parts in space. Process is arrangement of the parts in time. So you can describe everything in the world in terms of parts and wholes and their relations. Okay? So we've been in a system thinking class since what, January? And you ask what system thinking? Here's a definition you can use. And the problem we have is that people quite often focus on the parts. And you get some people who claim they're system thinkers and they come in and they focus on the holes, but there's also the relations. Because now we talk about doorknobs and you know, pulling doors and the person, it's like, okay, well, what's the system you're talking about? Okay, so I just do something. <laughs> Okay? Okay. So, in Russ Acoff's vocabulary, in authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis and the containing holes appreciate. Synthesis is putting things together, analysis is taking things apart. So why are you in a design program? A design program is often about putting things together. It is about synthesis. What's the difference between design and engineering? Engineers love to take things apart. Okay, fine. I, so I, I, I'm achieving my goal. I have the best teacher I met was um, Mary Ann Coses at IBM, and I said, because she had, we, we, at, at IBM, we had to teach vice presidents all the time. 
And you, you get to this point, I said, Marianne can get the people when they're squirming in their seats, but they're not yet checked out of the room. So I, have, I can see here people not yet checked out. I mean, you're struggling with your ideas, which is good. You have to get used to the ambiguity. But I'm trying to bring clarity, so I can give you definition, just to go with me on the six. Okay, so in Russ Acoff's definition, authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis. You put things together before you take things apart. Now, how do you put things together before you take things apart? You have to put things together because there's a containing whole. So you've got the system and you've got the containing whole. You've got the TDC, you've got the province. So firstly, identify the containing whole, which is the system, of the thing to be explained as a part. So the thing to be explained, you're trying to explain what's happening in the TTC. What is the containing whole? Look to the province. Secondly, explain the behavior and property of the containing whole. So the second step, we're not talking about the TTC anymore, we're talking about the province. The third one, explain the behavior and property of the thing to be explained in terms of the role or functions. Roles are the type we use for people, Functions are the term to use for um, things within its containing whole. So now you explain the TTC within the problems. Yes? Um, how does this, like, uh, master fit with the iterative inquiry process? Good question. Like, it looks kind of similar, right? Like the function structure, like the garden doggy. And then, like, once you get out far enough, you see, like, the context in which your whole exists in parts. Yep. So is this, is this built from... Is it, what, what John Chi Karagadagi was a consultant working directly for Russ Acoff. Spent his whole career doing that. Cool. Okay. So it's, like, built in the same... Yeah. yeah. We're channeling Russ. We're channeling Russ. Okay. Book. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. this thing is yeah. advocating top-down approaches to design. And there are other people who, you know, use bottom-up approaches where you look at all the parts first. And, and it's, you know, sometimes in IT I've learned you end up with a middle out approach because you need to do a little bit of bottom up, a lot of, a little bit of top down and make sure they meet the middle. Mm, am I like... It's, uh, there's danger in the words you're using. Okay. Um, because what do you mean by top and bottom? <laughs> when, I meant, when I said top, I meant like the containing whole. So looking at the context of a system, looking at the, all of the big functions before you think about the little parts inside. Because sometimes when you're designing something, that's a great approach. And you, you have all the, the context and you know your scope. And sometimes the, the devil's in the details and there's some little part that's actually the challenge. Okay, let's go back to the example, which is you're designing the TTC. Is yes. the first thing you do go to the public province? Um, Def I would look at governance structures because, you know... It's, it's not your job. It's your job to design the TDC. Do you go look at the province? Well, for money, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, but you see now, now this is system thinking, right? What happens, and this is what infuriates people, is system thinkers will come up and say, it's all about the province. It's not about the TDC. And you go, yeah, okay, then part, but the TDC. You know, and so it's like, no, it's, it's actually the TTC inside the province is a system inside the environment. Right, so this is the panarchy thing that you have to look at um, transportation funding and planning at a provincial and maybe federal level before, because that has a lot of dominance over what's happening municipally. Hold on, I'll get to that in a second. There's a slide going on panarchy. Okay, go. sure. Is everyone okay with this slide? <laughs> These are the slides I normally start a lecture with. The first two slides I always did, but now it's buried way down in the back, right? Okay, so, panarchy. Okay, so, people have focused on, they've kind of read the article, you get this adaptive loop. Okay, that's not the important part of the article. <laughs> the important part of the article is this one. Okay, which is what happens when you have panarchy, which is crossing levels of hierarchy. So, we'll take this one, which is the TTC in the middle. What would happen if the TTC collapsed? The TTC is a system. If it collapsed, there's two ways that you could have the system operate. One would be, and this is really theoretical, collapse down, which is you now have a transportation system which is all taxis. The taxis are slower, I'm sorry, they're faster and they're smaller. 
Now, taxi systems work really well in small municipalities you can't afford a bus system. So I come from Gravenhurst. Gravenhurst, running a bus system to Gravenhurst is kind of like that's ridiculous. Taxi if people don't need them. But there's also a possibility of collapsing up, collapsing into a larger and slower system. So if the TTC system collapsed and GO Transit was still running, you could get from Union Station to Main Station because there's a GO Station up there. You've been to Scarborough and this sort of stuff. Now, it's slower, it's less frequent, it is another system of operates. But these systems all work together. Now, Thinking about these systems and thinking about this, you should now be thinking about pacing layers, the site, the structure, all that sort of stuff. Because when you are designing a system, the question, and I really, I really, really dislike this Donnell uh, Meadows, where did you the system? Because, yeah, okay. So, um, because when you read Donnell Meadows and where did you the system, it gives you the impression that systems are flat. Oh, yeah, I just heard that. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's, and it's actually not a fault of the, of the article per se, but people come in and read it this way, and it's kind of like, no, no. Systems are structured within each other, system design systems, and they're systems over time, right? So when we take this view of structure, it puts us in a frame, which is what I just want to rip you out of now, because you understand this much. Okay? Because when you go into ecological psychology, this is a slide I like because it actually has this, as a, the name article asks it, which is saying, ask not what's inside your head, but what your head's inside. The ecological perspective, perspective. okay, so whenever I do these sort of things, it's kind of like um, the teacher when you do thesis work. Thesis work is you take a position, you always have to know what the counter position is going to be because you're always fighting against something. If you're creating new knowledge, some other knowledge will so if we go back to the beginnings, um, we're back in behavioral psychology and we're back with Pavlov's dog. So they ring the bell and they, get, they feed the dog, the dog salivates. You do that enough times, you ring the bell, you don't feed the dog, the dog still salivates. There's a stimulus and there's a response. That is working inside the head. So James J. Gibson was interested in driving and the phenomenon of landing airplanes. So how is it you explain landing airplanes when you're doing stimulus response inside the head? Because what's happening is you're trying to land the plane, you're looking outside and it's like, well, okay, stimulus response is, okay, there's a higher level of stimulus, a higher level of response, it's like, well, after that, it doesn't really work. So he came up with this idea of ecological uh, approach to perception, and now we're talking about not the doorknob. When you're talking in stimulus response, you're talking inside the doorknob. Here we want to focus on the interaction between the person and the doorknob. Now we're into affordances, and Gibson is the one that created the term affordant. So now we're going to go to Tim Ingold. And Tim Ingold has an interesting combination of J.J. Gibson's affordances with Gregory Bateson's Mind and Nature, um, which I never really understood until I started going through this. And so I titled this talk about representations. And so what happens when you draw the circle? So we're, we're talking about a system, and you draw a circle like that. What do you think that is? Is that like now kind of like system, and you got the environment outside? Well, actually, that's not what that drawing is. A drawing is actually a line, and the line doesn't actually close on itself. So, as opposed to thinking about systems that way, why don't we think about systems this way, which is a line. We'll draw a system as a line, and the line goes somewhere. Okay, this, this is a, a different way of looking at systems. We talked about structure and process, arrangement of time, arrangement of space. If you are thinking about arrangement in space first, you're thinking about structure. You're thinking about the system and environment in that way, right? But we have a different way, which is system and environment together. So we're not focused on the parts. We are focused on the relation between the parts. The system and the environment are not two separate things. 
they are one thing that is moving together in time. So how do you interpret this line? There's two ways of interpreting it. One is as a static perimeter. The other could be as a trajectory of movement. So this, this, I found this pretty interesting. If, uh, in gold, what is being anthropology, the first thing was that he got a fellowship and went to Finland and got to study the Sami people. So these are people that are so far north in Finland that it's kind of like, the Finland or Sweden is that we don't care. You know, it's so far north and there's so few people. Right. So, so, he, so he's done this research and also he, he links up quite a bit with the Inuit people here and because if you see lectures, if you're a YouTube person, you search up Tim Ingold, you'll find lots of lectures. He's a great speaker. Um, he's the type, he doesn't use any slides. Tim Ingold just talks. And then he writes up the talks and publishes them in books, right? Um, but the idea that we have now is that from the Inuit perspective, he talked about points versus lines. In the north, movement in a, is, is in the snow. So if there's something that is a dot, a point, and it's not moving, it's dead. For the Inuit, the only thing that matters are things that move. If you move, you are alive. If you don't move, you are dead. Now, in systems, there's this other part of um, people misunderstanding systems. And some people, when they think about systems, they think about equilibrium, supply equals demand, equilibrium, these sorts of things. The real definition of equilibrium when you're talking about a living system, the only state at which a living system is in equilibrium is when it's dead. So if you want to reach equilibrium, die. <laughs> <laughs> Systems operate with energy and matter and these sort of things, right? So we have what's called homeostasis, is a different term for it. It is not equilibrium. But we're now moving from the idea of things that are real. So there are two philosophies. One says the only things that are real are things that don't move, and that things are last. So mountains are real, buildings are real, because we can see them, we can touch them. There's another philosophy that says the only thing that is real are things that move. And when you're dealing with systems thinking, if you're doing really good systems thinking, which is really hard, you actually have to do both. There are both things that are real, and there are both things that move. You have to look at both the doorknob and the interaction in the affordance. <coughs> so, how does that change the way we represent? So, people talk about networks. You have these dots joined up by lines. How about instead if we think about each of us as a line? And we're moving in time, we're moving through the snow, and we intersect on top of each other. So, I've had my line, they have come. Today we are in a knot. We cross over, we have this interaction between us, we form a knot, and then we go our separate ways. We have our lines to continue on. But this is a process-oriented view of the world. Time comes first. The structure is there, but we're reorienting for time first. In Tim Ingold, we have an interesting question, and this may change the way that you think about all this. Um, question of what is learning, because we talk about learning as adaptation over time, these sorts of things. Um, there's two ways of looking at learning. Conventional way, and in particular, if we're looking towards artificial intelligence sorts of applications, there is the transmission of representations and the education of attention. The transmission of representation, so if you thought that my role in educating you here today was to come and take my knowledge and take it from my brain and put it in your brain, that's the transmission of representations. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is trying to do an education of attention. What I'm trying to do is tell you, pay attention to this, don't pay attention to that. Right? If you wanted the transmission of representations, you already have the reading list. Everything that I told you is pretty well in the reading list in one form or another. And so it's like you read the reading list, it's like, well, you've learned everything. It's like, well, no, that's not the way the world works. The way the world works is that you have this education attention. Tim Ingold makes a distinction between a maze and a labyrinth. 
A maze has multiple ways in, multiple ways out, and it has dead ends inside. A labyrinth has one way in, one way out, and these curves, there's no dead ends in the labyrinth. You just follow the labyrinth around. Now, for those who are into obscure history, you've seen the movie Inception. The in Inception, the principal character is named after the thread that goes into a labyrinth because you pull the way in and out. Right? So, what happens in a labyrinth? So, um, there are actually a labyrinth in Toronto, so next time you go by um, in Phillips Square, across the street to the uh, Church of the Holy Trinity, uh, there is a labyrinth on the west side of the church. It's on the ground, it's not like you have to walk around and not like see it. But there's this thing in the ground, and there's one path in, there's one path out. So why would people even be interested in labyrinths? And what's the risk of going to a labyrinth? They're not going to get lost. There's no dead end to the labyrinth. The problem with getting into a labyrinth is actually attention. So you get a labyrinth and you forget why you're there. And you get stuck. So what we're trying to do in system thinking, what Tumi's goal and what the philosophy is trying to do is try to get you into the labyrinth. And it's not like, wow, that's a great painting. And they just freeze there and you stay in that painting. It's like, no, no. It's great to look at that painting. We're going to move on a little bit. We're going to educate your attention. Uh, but this changes, and philosophically, so this is where I'm at the research. I'm actually starting to look at cognitive systems, artificial intelligence. So I'm at IBM Research next week at all of it. This is sort of what we're discussing, you know, in artificial intelligence. And I want to ask the question now um, do computers, are we getting computers to the point where they actually are doing education of attention, as opposed to doing uh, all the stuff about uh, transmission representations? Because it's possible that we get, if you think about event driven systems and the way the artificial intelligence works, it's kind of like you see something and then something happens, but it's not a stimulus response. Right? It's now we're into the affordances, flying the plane, and these sorts of things. Okay, so um, there was a whole body of work on inquiring systems, which I'm not going to cover. Um, I'm going to close this class the uh, same way that I closed yesterday's class. Uh, I'm going to skip to the end because um, I'm going next week to see Ian Mitroff, and I really like this one idea. Um, now, when we talk about system thinking versus system science, science is a pursuit of truth. It doesn't mean you attain the truth, but you do that. And so the question about how you know comes out and what is science about. So um, science will lead you in different directions, and um, uh, Ian has this book, um, a really buried book called Dirty Rotten Strategies, and he uses, quote, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. Thomas Pinchon, Gravity's Rainbow, which I haven't read. I haven't read it, so I'll have to read more. I haven't actually read the book. Um, but science um, leads you towards, towards representations of the world and then representing it other ways. So, um, there are errors, though, that happen in science, but people understand that. So people, how many people know from statistics type 1 and type 2 errors? Okay. Small, small group. <laughs> so here's what happens. And the usual example we talk about is drug testing. Um, I answer. So you're going to test a drug. Does the drug work or does it not work? Okay. The first type of error, type 1 error, false positive. We find a statistical relation that is not true. So you say the drug works but it actually doesn't work, that is a type 1 error. Science tells you the drug works, but it doesn't work, that's a type 1 error. Type 2 error, false negative. You actually do the test, it says the drug doesn't work, but it actually does work. There's an error associated with that. The third way is a type 3 error, which system thinkers often say is solving the wrong problem. So we shouldn't have been doing that drug at all. There's no point in working on that drug. Um, I am going reframe this and say it's tricking ourselves that we think that the drug works and therefore we're promoting it. And he's come across this fourth type of error, which is type four. Now this is an ion fit problem. This is really profound. Um, when I read this, I'm like, wow, no one else wants to this up. A type four error is not, is a type three error except people are doing it intentionally. They're misleading you. 
because they're doing exactly what Thomas Pinchon said. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, you don't have to worry about the answer. So, just to wrap this up, I'm actually bridging between science and philosophy here. So, for those of you who have not read any philosophy, a lot of systems goes over that bridge because science is generally about pursuing better answers. Philosophy is about choosing better questions. So when I talk to you about the affordance, I'm talking to you about the doorknob. There are people who design doorknobs, and there are people who design the interaction with the doorknob. You need both, but there are different philosophies. So it's okay for you to be saying that you're in this philosophy and you're doing this and you're presenting this work. But when you are doing a representation, which is what this thing was about, you are, you are passing that representation on to other people. And now you are definitely bringing this full. Um, I'll pause and take some questions. The whole thing. So let me take you back to... Uh, there you go. That's kind of what we've covered. There's a lot. So we covered architecting and designing. You kind of understand or have a sense of how they're different. Services and production systems. You might think about in your projects as you're working, are you taking a production orientation, you take a service orientation. Um, you might take the pattern minded approach, you understand affordances. And you understand that there's actually, we're not blowing smoke here, there's actually some research behind this and kind of get a sense of how. You're not doing a PhD, you, know, you are doing a master's, so you don't have to do the philosophy, you understand the technical law. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering, when you talk about, so we've done, in the first part of this course, we did a lot of mapping, mm -hmm. right? To sort of understand the whole and the parts and the functions and how they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. But I've found that when we go through that process, it's like an abstraction of the reality of interactions mm -hmm. because they're very complex. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about something like affordances and pattern languages, like I wonder if you could just comment on what you kind of gain and what you kind of lose when you abstract a, a discrete path. Like, do you know what I mean? Like sometimes you kind of, that's my observation. I don't yeah. know enough about it. Yeah, so um, the mapping is in some respects not about the reality of the world. It is about you and your peers developing an understanding and a perspective. Um, what happens when you create that map is a lot of people just focus on the map and say, well, that must be the truth of the world. Um, you have to peel that back an extra level and say, where were these people coming from? Um, so the sort of things when, when I'm looking at system maps, and I look at system context, it, when I see the maps coming from this platform, and you guys have a really tough job because you're doing a lot of work in a very short period of time. Um, the systemness is really a tough part to get. Um, I think the primary coaching I'd give you on your map is, are you looking at the system, or are you looking at the system in the environment? And when you're looking at your map, also, is that a structural map, or is that a process map? Because they both exist. Now, if you're to be an enterprise architect, and you're designing a system, they do all these different perspectives, right? They know process, they know structure, there's multiple ways of mapping it. They don't just build one map, they build multiple maps. So, does that help? Yeah, it, it does in a bit because it's just really how you, s what your starting point framework is or like your perspective defines like how you come up with your understanding of the whole picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the part about service systems and production systems I think is pretty neat because you could basically look at the same system in two ways and come up with, like the bus system could be a fully production mm -hmm. or it could be user-centric service if you actually care about the people interacting with the different parts and you design for that, right? Well, that a, a, bus, a, bus system, a bus system that tries to be a taxi system is going to be a bad bus system. Right, but would you not be able to, okay, so maybe then you could explain this because I kind of have it in my head that if I was, if I was working on a 
a public transportation system like a service system, uh -huh. then there would be different considerations for the users in the system as opposed to the simple production of like, here's the routes and like, here's my data mapping and that's all I care about, I can get this to here. What? Like, do, is there like a difference there? Or? What, what, what is most important in a bus system is, or like I, I, I it looks like airlines, right? Mm -hmm. These are all scheduled systems. What's important is that they are on time. And so they have to build in, so you know, it's much more apparent in airlines, they build in buffers and you know, planes ride on time, which is pretty miraculous, because you fly 14 hours and rise on a minute, right? Uh, so designing an, air, uh, an airplane network like a service system, you have to be careful about how you're doing that, right? There are local perspectives associated with it. And so you can take in the, the, whole, the whole thing, the people are connecting, you run the hubs, and then you also take it in the customer perspective, but you do multiple perspectives on that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, I feel like if I were in anything over this class, <laughs> not this class, but like okay. this class, that for me, what kind of has made it feel like is coming together a bit is that it depends on your audience. It depends on like what the point of your map is. It depends on the question that you're trying to answer. And then the kinds of maps, the systems that you have to represent in those maps, boundaries that everything just comes back to like what are you trying to answer and for who and then that kind of helps shape so if you have something that you really need to get into this like an understanding of that social system or whatever then there's a different set of boundaries than if you're trying to explain just like the technical whatever and that to me was like a really critical piece of making it come together i don't know <laughs> I would actually say the same is true with statistics. One of the things that Ian Clark taught us is that you can make statistics do whatever you want. I think that you could probably do the same with mapping, that you could map things and, and you'll get what you want to map. So those are tools. You do have to decide what the priorities are and I think that's and what it is you want to find. And that's where the research questions are really important in terms of Defining your your search, your query, right? Okay. So I've run over time. Thank you for your time, and I'll turn it back over. <laughs>